The most important thing that we can do as we develop AGI is to develop a means to bring the free energy across the latent variable layer to a minimum. This gives us control over all the other processes that we'd care to introduce, whether they're processes between the neurons or the nodes that take place over time, for example, growing specific connections, or whether they're dynamic, nearly instantaneous processes that happen as a result of stimulus or perturbations or other activities in the system. The thing that gives us control, this is what's been missing in all the neural networks methods up until now, is a means of bringing the free energy in that latent layer grid of nodes to a free energy minimum. This video is going to give you practical, specific guidance for going hands-on and actually studying the free energy minimization process with a real example that you can control. In an interactive code that we previously presented, this time you're just taking it one step further. Now earlier in previous vids, we introduced interactive code for the one-dimensional cluster variation method. And that specific piece of code let you do a swap of two nodes in a grid of, of nodes or neurons. This grid of nodes embodying a one-dimensional cluster variation method is an illustration of what we're going to use in building corticons, content retent of temporally connected neural networks that are a core element in creating an AGI. We will link to all the preceding vids that you need to catch up with this, their blog posts, the code itself, the GitHub directory, and anything else that you need to play a complete game of catch up and be able to experiment fully over these next several days. In the blog post that is associated with this vid, check the description box below. Now, in that previous code, you were able to swap out two nodes that had different activations. When you did that, you changed the entropy of the system. This is remarkable. You weren't changing the number of active nodes. You were changing their positions relative to each other, and that changed the entropy. We're working with a form of entropy that is relatively new to the neural network's AI community. That is the cluster variation method introduced by Kikuchi 1950s and then refined by Kikuchi and Brush 1967 still relatively unknown, although respected in the circles that know of this work. Now what we have is an implementation where you can go hands-on and play with it. This is for the one-dimensional version. It is the simplest possible implementation. Now we've mentioned this before in previous vids. This code is set up to have an equal number of on and off nodes. Equal number means that we have an analytic solution available to us, and when we have the analytic solution, we can do things that is find where we are relative to the single parameter that controls the interaction enthalpies, that's the one parameter available for play, and see where we are in terms of bringing the system to equilibrium for that interaction enthalpy parameter. This means that we can actually test the system's closeness to equilibrium, and even more, sometimes when we play this game and swap out nodes, we have configuration variables that result that more or less line up against a single interaction enthalpy parameter value, and sometimes they're dispersed. In a lot of the experiments that I've run prior to now with grids that I've created for the two-dimensional case, either creating them by hand to test a little premise or notion that I had, or in those cases where I took some sort of natural terrain, made a representation of that terrain, and then assessed that representation in terms of its closeness to equilibrium for a specific enthalpy parameter, I'd find that the enthalpy parameter values associated with the different configuration variables were all over the place. We can identify the best interaction enthalpy parameter using a divergence method and that method is new and specific to working with the cluster variation method. I devised that last year. But we're not going to go there today. Now, in case we haven't met before, I'm Aliana Moren. I'm the founder and chief scientist with Themesis Incorporated. We're a boutique AI company. We are doing research in AGI and sharing a great deal of what we're discovering and creating with you under the MIT license agreement. Specifically, the work that we're sharing with you today is using code that we've already developed and placed in an open GitHub repository. We're also doing a great deal in terms of AI education, and please be on the lookout 
for an upcoming Themesis short course in the top 10 terms in statistical mechanics designed to empower you to read those classic works in energy-based neural networks. But back to our main theme, which is how you can play over these Christmas holidays even with a simple foundational system that will enable you over time to work towards building AGI. Now imagine with me that you're driving a car and you've got a child in the back seat and every few minutes the, the child is saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you're just about to that frustration point and you're saying, okay kid, how about you play with this new video game that I bought just for this occasion to keep you distracted? When we're driving the car and the child's asking about, are we there yet? It's distracting. We don't want to hear that. But in an AGI, we want to always be asking the question of, are we at equilibrium? Are we at equilibrium? How close are we to equilibrium? What can we do to bring this system closer to equilibrium? Now let's review the fundamentals. We have an external reality that using Christen's notation, see the previous YouTube, we're calling Psi, P-S-I, Greek trident shaped capital letter. That's our external world. We have a representation of the external world. The representation is constantly being updated. We're talking in a Fristonian sense, working our way towards active inference. We're not going to get there today. We're just sort of like a spacecraft trying to dock with the old space station. We're trying to like bring ourselves closer and closer. So we're sharing notation and we're sharing some concepts. The representation is interacting with that external reality psi via agents of some sort that both take information in, they're sensing agents, and acting upon the environment. Those are the action agents, sensing action. Because the external reality is always changing, the representation is changing. In addition to the representation, we have a model of the representation. We want to bring the model to equilibrium. We have no control over bringing the representation to equilibrium. The representation is, is responding to its interactions with the environment, and we want it to do that. And we're not trying to modify the representation and change it in a control fashion. We are trying. Instead, we want to modify and adapt and update the model. The unique thing about what we're doing is that the model itself can come to equilibrium. This is unique to working with the corticons and specifically to the cluster variation method grid of neurons within a corticon. We can bring the model to equilibrium subject to changing just two parameters. Those are the interaction enthalpy and the activation enthalpy. The activation enthalpy is epsilon zero. We are keeping this set to zero. That is ensuring that we have equal numbers of nodes in state A and state B. This is what lets us apply an analytic solution. Additionally, we have that interaction enthalpy parameter, epsilon 1, and we're going to often refer to this as the h value because h is defined as the exponent of epsilon 1 divided by 4. That's how it works out for the 1D cluster variation method. And it is just easier to talk about the h value as we express the configuration variables in the system as functions of that h value. And I will often say h value instead of h because if I'm just saying h, you don't know if I'm coughing or saying a letter. So h value, it flows fairly smoothly off the tongue and it's a little bit easier than saying epsilon 1. So here we are. We have a system. We have a grid of nodes laid out according to the one-dimensional cluster variation method, single zigzag chain topography. Our initial grid configuration is that we're replicating one pattern three times and it ensures, this pattern ensures that we are at equilibrium for the case where not only is the epsilon zero equal to zero, equal numbers of A and B, but also epsilon one is equal to zero. That is, we don't have any interactions between these nodes. Did We have created this grid so that we have the perfect number of at equilibrium configuration variable value. That is the number of the different y pairs, that is the nearest neighbors on the diagonal. The number of next nearest neighbor pairs, that is the next nearest neighbor on the same row. And the numbers of different kinds of triplets, those are chevron shaped, are exactly what we would have for the equ equilibrium situation. When you experiment, you're going to swap out two of those nodes you will change the at equilibrium 
configuration that exists when we have those two parameters set to zero to something else. Because we have an analytic solution that is obtained by taking the free energy equation, taking the derivative of it separately with six different configuration variables, you have six equations that can be solved analytically and it gets a little bit interesting but you can solve it so that you have each configuration variable as a function of this h value. Now the details of that analytic solution are presented in a paper that I wrote in 2014, link in the blog post. It suffices that we have three equations that we're using to demonstrate the analytic solution and to demonstrate whether or not a system is at or close to equilibrium or is completely skewed and is very far off, not only in terms of with regard to a specific H value, but is our different configuration variables suggesting that they each have an associated H value that is different from the others. That's happened when I've done my own experiments. It's not too likely to be the case here, but we're going to see some subtle and modest differences between pure between a pure single H value that satisfies all of our configuration variables versus something that's all spread over. So let's figure out how you can play with this system and replicate our results. There are three steps to get started. The first step is to get the code. Go to our GitHub repository for the simple 1D CVM with Turtle. By the way, the Turtle has been commented out, but you can uncomment that easily. Uh, you want the version 1.5.5. If there's any more recent versions, they will work just as well. You can find the link to our code directory in the blog post, and also I'll show you how to get to our primary resource page in just a moment. Once you have that code, install it into any Python idle. We use Anaconda Spider, but your favorite will do. And then get the PowerPoint that has the analytic solution. That's the graph that we've been showing all along. You can download that direct from our resource page for the 1D CVM. And that's the page that also has a link to the GitHub repository. Alternatively, go to our blog post, see the link in the description box below, and that has a link to the content page, which will of course take you to the PowerPoint, the GitHub repo, and a link to a technical report that has the derivation for this analytic solution. There's also a link to an Excel spreadsheet that works out these analytic values for the 1D CVM. All of these are prep steps. You may want to print out a copy of that analytic solution graph. Once you've done this, you may also just want to refresh yourself by running through some of the previous YouTubes on how to work with the code. Once you've done that, the next step is to run the code. Very simple, just hit that run button. And a previous YouTube walked you through how to do the various steps in great detail. Take note of your results, especially for the Y2, Z1 and Z3 values. Please note that what you see in the code outputs for the Y2 is actually 2 times Y2. You can see that here. And what we show on the graph is the graph of Y2 itself as a function of the H value. You may choose to make a little table such as we've done here. Now comes the fun part. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the purpose of this entire little exercise. Let's check the graph for the case where epsilon 1 equals 0 or h equals 1. This is the equilibrium point when we have no interaction energy between the various nodes. We notice that the values on the graph for h equals 1 correspond exactly to the results that we obtained in the first part of our run where we were working with the equilibrium situation. Specifically, the values for z1 and z3 are both 0 0.125, that's the analytic predicted solution, and also we're showing here that the value for y2, that's 2 times y2, is 0 0.5, the value for y2 itself is 0 0.25, and that's exactly what we're desiring, and it's exactly what we see on the graph. We've established a reference point. Now let's see what happens when we swap out two nodes. We're going to use as the example the one that I used in the previous vid, so we're just going to continue that theme. After we swap two nodes, we have new values for Z1, Z3, and Y2. Now before we dive into our interpretation, let's pull back for a moment and take a look at the analytic predicted values for the various configuration variables, that's the Y's, the W's, and the Z's. In terms of their expected fractional values, when you have no interaction between the nodes and you're thus not pulling things one direction or another. I've taken this slide from this particular YouTube. It was one of the earliest YouTubes that we produced on the 1D CVM, and it goes through a lot of the details on the configuration variables. 
Also, you may want to check out the two papers that I put out 2014 and 2016 timeframe that go through the 1D CVM in great detail. You can get access to those on the resource page. We've shown you how to get there already. So back to our discussion on the fractional values for these different configuration variables. You'll notice that for the Y's and the W's, the Y2 and the W2 each have a degeneracy of two, meaning that there's two different ways to count them. If you get an equal distribution amongst the possible states, you'll have one quarter of the Y's being a Y1, one quarter being an AB Y2, one quarter being a BA Y2, and one quarter being a BB Y2. So you're going to get fractional values of 0.25 for each, but because you can count that Y2 two different ways, AB and BA, we'll just put them together and say that 2 times Y2 is 0.5. So you can see how the W2s will have a similar value. And when it comes to the Zs, we have six different kinds of Zs. Two of them, Z2 and Z5, have degeneracies of two, so they're counted twice. So with this, let's return to our table of observed configuration variable values, and we'll map those onto the analytic graph that we have for configuration variable values in terms of H. You can see this here. We have three different vertical lines corresponding to the H values for each of the three configuration variable values that we're considering. At the far left, with the red dashed line and the red lettering, we've got Z3 equals 0 0.208. Somewhat more to the middle, we've got Z1 in green lettering associated with a green graph curve. Z1 equals 0 0.083. And then on the far right of the set of three vertical lines for H values, we've got Y2 equals 0 0.291. That's in purple with the purple dashed line. So let's interpret what we've got here. We've got a set of three different possible H values, ranging from approximately 0.75 to about 0.83. We're not going to try to be precise here because none of them would be a real H value for the system. We see that there's a slight dispersion, a very small range that they cover. At the same time, it is definitely within a range that is to the left of where H equals 1 or epsilon 1 equals 0, meaning that we have a negative value for epsilon 1. Let's go back to our original equation for the free energy in a one-dimensional cluster variation method system and find out what that means in terms of the enthalpy term. Let's remind ourselves that we're dealing with the free energy of a system, and the free energy is equal to the enthalpy minus the entropy. So we often think in terms of the neg entropy of a system. We've been talking about the entropy for the longest time, and they've given it all of our attention, and really, this is the very first time that we've even given a glance to the enthalpy term. So we see that the negative entropy, and I know that this is the entropy for just a simple system with on and off nodes. We're not talking about configuration variables in this diagram, but the idea is the same. We get maximal entropy when we have a maximal distribution amongst all possible states, which is when we have approximately equal numbers of the various configuration variables, taking into account the degeneracy, of course. So when we turn our attention to the enthalpy, what we're looking for is something that will take the minimum point of the free energy curve defined as enthalpy plus the negative entropy, that is, the enthalpy added onto this bowl-shaped curve even lower. We're looking for something that will take it to a deeper minimum. So we look at this enthalpy term and realize that if epsilon is negative, then we want y2 to be as large as possible because that negative epsilon multiplied by the positive y2 will be a larger negative value. So we're going to go in the direction of pushing y2 large. That means that y1 and y3 will both be smaller values. Let's take a look at our little crib sheet on the configuration variables and figure out what that means for the z1 and z3 variables. When y2 is a little bit larger, meaning we have more AB or BA pairs, then z1 for the AAA triplets, where we have greater clustering of like near like, is going to be smaller. And conversely, z3, which is the ABA triplet, will be larger. With these notions in mind, let's return to our table of observed configuration variable values after we've made our node swap we notice that y2 is larger as a result of our swap. And because y2 is larger, z3 is also larger, and z1 is smaller. Let's take a look at how this shows up when we relook at our analytic graph. 
we see that our age values are all fairly close together. That's expected. And that's matching our sense of how the Y2, Z1, and Z3 values have shifted after we did that node swap. We're pretty good now with our analytics, but let's go back to our original node swap diagram and figure out exactly what happened. It might seem as though we were actually making a bigger cluster by inserting that new black, it's actually colored red here, node in the middle of two nodes on either side that, that look as though it should have extended the cluster size. But actually it didn't. In order to get a cluster, we need diagonals of the same type. What we had done when we made this particular node swap was we'd swapped out a node that was part of a cluster. You can see that black, 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 or AAA cluster in the far left of the original configuration. And we had changed one of those nodes. So we actually had reduced the clustering. When we reduce the clustering, we're effectively increasing the non-clustering configuration variables. That is, we increased the Y2, we increased the Z3, but we lowered the Z1. What we wound up with was a system that was less clustered, and that showed up in each of our three different H values. So let's pull back and assess what we've just done. We found out that we can not only swap out nodes and change the configuration variables, and thus change the entropy, we can also identify at least a range of H values that would identify a new equilibrium point for this system. Now to get the best H value, of course we'd have to pull out the divergence method that I mentioned earlier, and we're going to save that for another day. Let's just trust that we have a divergence method, we can use it and identify the best H value once we have a new configuration grid because we swapped out some nodes. What you have the opportunity to do now because you have control over the node swap and seeing the resulting configuration variables and testing them now that you've got the analytic solution at your disposal, you'll be able to observe where we are with regard to that analytic solution and from that determine an H value that is most appropriate. That means that you're determining how far from the original equilibrium position we've moved to a new different equilibrium position. Not only that, we're setting the stage for us to play with active inference. We're not there yet. You can see how far we've moved from an original equilibrium position with an original H value at time zero to a new equilibrium position one time step further down the road with a different H value, a different interaction enthalpy parameter. And over a series of temporal episodes, you can say, oh, the system is moving in this direction. We can anticipate where the system is going to go. We can adapt the model in advance of actually being there, which brings us into the kinds of control that we would really love to have for an AGI. Now, before we get there, we're going to need a divergence method. We'll discuss that in the next vid. Today, I just want to walk you through the process for working with what you've got at hand and introducing a few games that you can play. This is going to be just a lovely little Christmas time present, really. It's just a a toy, it's a diversion, something though that will help you build an AGI for real over these coming months and into the remainder of 2024. Thank you for joining me. Once again, I'm Aliana Moren, Founder and Chief Scientist with Themesis. Happy Holidays and we hope you have a lovely day. We'd love to have you join us and some of our events are released via email only. They're not mentioned on YouTube, so please, to be part of the Themesis community, come over to Themesis click the About button, or just go directly to www.themesis.com forward slash themesis. Scroll down to the opt-in form, do the opt-in thing, including that confirmation email, and please move our emails to your preferred folder because we'd love to be in touch with you and very special offers are on their way. Have a most lovely day. We'll connect soon.